you, thank you. Oh, da, 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 da. It's got that little kind of beat to it, right? It just kind of makes you feel a little joy in your heart. Uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. Wow, okay. So we've been doing How Shall We Live, knowing that we will die uh, for the last few weeks. And it's really about these four simple questions that spiritual seekers for centuries have asked. Like, what time do we hold the Christmas candle lighting service? We took a survey last week. <laughs> so you weren't here, and there was no consensus, which just reminds us that we can never please everybody all the time. We can't please anybody all the time, but we can please some people some of the time. So just go with whatever year it is. Birthday celebrations, overwhelmingly to continue that. Uh, need to need lunch bunch, 11 people were interested. This will go on to the social team. And listening devices, we have three requests, so our tech team will start doing some explorations on that. So thank you for those of you that answered that questionnaire. And now to the real spiritual questions of how do we live. The questions that we really need to ask ourselves all the time is who am I? What do I love? How shall I live knowing that I will die? And what is my gift to the family of the earth? So just a little review from a couple weeks ago. We started this, you know, who am I? We have a sacred self and we have a shadow self. And our sacred self, our true self, is, has many different facets to it. But we don't like to own all of them and that becomes our sacred shadow self. And the only thing that's about the shadow self is just we haven't owned it yet. Most of the things we think we keep in the shadow, everybody else knows, and we just don't acknowledge it, right? Then who do I love? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where you put that deep energy, that is what you value in your life, whatever that might look like. And darshan is a Hindu term that means to look at something, to really see something and see the sacredness of it. And we think about what do we love? It's about being able to do the darshan wherever we look look at things as a sacred, as a deity into itself, as that divine light shining. And we talked about that perhaps with love, which is the whole gamut of the happiness of love, but there's also always grief in involved. Grief is part of the whole love spectrum. And we talked about maybe it's time to hospice, the old way of creating peace with whoever's the strongest, whoever has the bigger army, whoever has the most power, you know, try to create peace with war is just such an oxymoron. And that we could start midwifing, bringing birthing to a new way of being peaceful, loving, actually loving our world into peace. Think about it. How if we love it into peace instead of becoming bilateral on everything, that right and wrong as opposed to oneness. And then last week, we talked about, you know, knowing we're going to die, how do we live? And the choices that we make in our life really is about how we invest our time, how we invest our energy, how we invest our finances, how we invest our thoughts, how we invest our relationships. And instead of thing, trying to get through life, it's about savoring the life that we have with everything that we do, that this is just precious and special. None of us know how long we have other than six minutes, because that's how long it takes the body to die. So we know we're guaranteed the next six minutes. I'll try to get the important parts in. <laughs> <laughs> Last week also, I told you a story about uh, a man who figured he had 20 more years to live, and he counted up the number of Saturdays. It was going to be about 1,000 Saturdays, and he put 1,000 marbles in the jar, and every Saturday he took one out. And then he gets down to the bottom, and you know, took the last one out. He, he, no, he did not die at that time, but it just made him realize how precious life is and how it just keeps getting shorter and shorter as we live through it. So it's about kind of spending our marbles wisely as we take them out of that jar. What are we doing? What are we doing? And how are we doing it? So think about thinking about that and spending our marbles. Where's our joy right now? All of us probably had different answers this morning. Uh, about what joy is for us, and it's really a lot of things, and it's the same thing at the same time, kind of like that idea of love. But I want to share this quote from a New Year's Eve service from a friar over in Italy, 1531. So the country is right at the beginning of the Renaissance age, after horrific times before. That, yeah, so life is starting to get better. And he said, no heaven can come to us unless our hearts find rest in today. Take heaven. No peace lies in the future that is not hidden in this present moment. Take peace. I forgot people were so smart back in the 1500s. You know? <laughs> the gloom of this world is but a shadow behind it, yet within reach 
is joy. Like sunshine when there's clouds, you know, in the daily word, the sun is always there even if we can't see it. There is a radiance and glory in the darkness, could we but see? And to see, we only have to look. To see, we only have to look. I beseech you to look, life is so generous a giver. Wow, life is so generous a giver. So where, where do we find this joy in our life now? What gives us joy? How do we get a more joy-filled life? How do we become more conscious of it in a more consistent manner? Jesus says to his disciples, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. And if we start thinking about that a little deeper, a little more metaphysically, ask in my name, ask in the name of the Christ, that higher consciousness within each of us, align ourselves with those higher vibrations within us, align ourselves with the joy that is always there, the essence that is always there, even when it's shadowed by outer circumstances. Then our joy is complete. We realize that connection with that divine within each of us, that divine spark, if you will. So joy, you can think of as the fruit of the spirit. Joy is, um, I was talking to Greg about this, you know, the idea of joy and happiness. And where I felt it in my body. And happiness comes with a smile. Joy doesn't always come with a smile. Sometimes joy is just an internal bubbling feeling, this fountain of joy that's always within us, even though sometimes we're not cognizant of it. Joy is those aha moments that we get in our spiritual journeys, where there's just that brief second where we know the truth, and the truth really does set us free. We just go, oh, and the next moment we might be out of that, but we know it's there. We get that glimmer from time to time, if you will. So joy is not contingent on our circumstances. And I look at this little boy there crying in the rain, right? He's, the baseball game just got called off, or his family was going on a picnic, or they were going to go to the amusement park, and parents said, oh, we're not going to go in the rain. Not contingent on our circumstances. Look at this, this little girl, she's enjoying the rain, she's loving it, she's being right in the moment. And no matter what activities got changed, she's able to just take delight in that, using her own inner choices about what to call this thing called rain that's coming down. And think about it, do you let yourself be grateful for being delighted? Do you let yourself be grateful for being in joy? I mean, I know most of the time I just go, oh, feeling good today, and I don't think, wow, thank you, Sharon. This is, you just really connected with that joy today. You know, there was a, the sun was brilliant coming in, and I could just, it was a warm feeling. It was like sitting by a fireplace feeling. It's, um, <laughs> my favorite artist, Brian Andreas, had a little cartoon out today called Cookies, because in his calendar today is Bake a Cookie Day. That's a holiday, if you didn't know it, so go home and bake cookies. But he said he remember the first time he ate a cookie, it tasted like his mother's hug. It tasted salty like the ocean. It tasted warm like being in the sun. It was a few years later before he realized that all cookies taste that way if they're warm out of the oven and you're with somebody that you love. Like that joy of biting into a warm cookie with your loved ones, right? So. Joy really is about the raw materials. It's not something you got to study. I don't think you can read about it really to have, I mean, you can intellectualize about it, but it, it's this experience that comes from the very basic things in life. You know, Wayne Muller's book, How Then Do We Live? He tells a story about this man that came to him, Jack. He was an artist and an art teacher. He was middle-aged and he was very depressed, frustrated, kind of the internal anger when you're not satisfied with your stuff, that you expected a whole lot more of life, and you reach that point and say, that dream of mine is never going to come true. And he's really struggling. Uh, he had really thought himself that he'd be able to live from his artwork. And it hadn't happened, so in order to eat, he took a job as an art teacher at a local college. So he came in, and he was, he was really living the myth of the artist. You know, what do, they, what do they call it? Poor, struggling artist. I mean, those words just go together. You say artist, you think poor and struggling. Um, I don't know who ever came up with that, but it's just an awful curse to put on anybody who's creative or artistic that poor and struggling comes right, be right next to it. I mean, silly, silly thing. 
So as you know, he's talking and explaining to Wayne Muller what's going on, and Wayne said a couple things that just really struck me. And one of them, he, he, when he looked at the man, he says, I notice in you two distinct ways of being. I hear your frustration, your depression, your disappointment that this dream of being an artist never came true. And I also hear this wonderful joy that you get from teaching. And I know you're appreciated because people ask to be in your art class. That's how important that you are to these students. And when you talk about your teacher activities, there's a sense of ease about it. There's a, a beauty of it. And he goes, well, you know, when I teach my students, well, first he said, well, the way that I paint is um, I, I take my paint and my brush and I allow the paints to tell me where to go. He listens to the tools that he's working with. He gets, I'd call it getting in the zone. He's just in the zone there. So he, he tells his students to be easy and to let the colors tell you where to go. This is not about effort and struggling. This is about being in that peaceful joy that you get happiness. Whenever you create, no matter whether it's baking a cookie or making a Mona Lisa, there's a joy that comes in creating because you get into that zone, you get into that space. And he would tell the students the same thing, to let the colors tell you where to go. You don't kind of push it. So this is really official permission to stop pushing. You know, whatever your dream is, to just let it happen, to let it evolve. Just follow the colors in your life about where you're going. Because the push factor, <laughs> that poor guy with that rock, think about if we pushed less and allowed what is necessary to emerge from the canvas of today. Every day we get this blank slate and we get to paint it. What would it be like if we didn't have the to-do list that ran our lives and then when that got over, then we were going to be able to do what brought us joy? What would our, how would our life be different? I think of how many times even Jesus in his ministry, he would know he needed time alone. His disciples were very upset because they knew that they needed to go places, they needed to do things, they needed to meet all these deadlines and, and these things they had to do. And he'd just say, he would just stop. I got to do what I got to do kind of thing. And also the things that happen, if you think about it, they have no eternal significance. Anything that upsets us, anything that seems unreal, that is unfair, in eternity means nothing. It's a blip, not even a blip. It is just so tiny, so teensy. When we focus on the problems, we're blinded to that greater perspective of life. And you know, this thing about no eternal significance, um, as I mentioned last week, my sister had passed. This week I spent working on her obituary. And well, you know, a joyful thing is reading somebody's obituary because we only talk about the great stuff about them. And as you go through them, I mean, I, I read her obit and I just smile. She just brought so much joy in life. I don't, maybe we had fights. <laughs> I can think of one. Uh, <laughs> you know, how are you going to take care of your parents? This is a common fight with siblings, right? But you don't, that, all that washes away when you're no longer tied to that humanity and, and the, the finite. When you step into that infinite world, there's just... Yeah, it just raises everything up a little bit. So I'm going to share some words with you from a famous, famous spiritual leaders, Simon and Garfunkel, because I think they really got it down about what it's like to live in joy. If you find yourself singing, that's OK, too. Slow down. You move too fast. You've got to make the morning last. Just kicking down those cobblestones, looking for fun and feeling groovy. <laughs> Hey, lamppost, what you knowin'? Ain't you got, uh, I came here to watch your flowers growing. Ain't you got no rhymes for me? Do it, do, do, feeling hoovy, yeah. I got no deeds to do, no promises to keep. I'm dappled and drowsy and ready to sleep. Let the morning time drop all its petals on me. Life, I love you. All is groovy. Isn't, you just get that feeling. It's like, you know, something wonderful. There's that. Wouldn't that be great to really be able to stay in that space of ease and grace as, as we go through life? Well, I think one idea is to do a joy day planner, that you have all your appointments, but suppose you actually plot it out in advance, time you're going to devote to joy, like yearly, you know, planning some time off. 
oh my goodness, time off for joy, is that allowed? <laughs> and then in the, during the month, you might add little rewards, you know, night out at the movies, take yourself on a date, <laughs> you know, go fishing, whatever that might be. Daily, breathe. Now, you're saying, but Sharon, we breathe all the time. Yeah, but most of the time, we're not conscious of it. Most of the time, our lungs go, they're working so hard for us, and we just ignore them. But just that one time, <sighs> there's such a joy to that. There really is a joy. And then multiple times a day, quit. Quit things, just stop. Sometimes you just need a stop and a break. Just quit and stop. It's okay. The world will not stop unless you're a doctor doing heart surgery. <laughs> you know, so be mindful of what you're involved in, but you know, for the most part, just stop, take a break, breathe, whatever that might be for you. For every time, there is a time for every matter under heaven, Ecclesiastes. Believe me, there is a time if we just allow our priorities to follow the color, to follow the brush, to follow where we're being gently led to, if you will. So the price of life, and this, I really want you to pay attention to it, it is not a debt. It is not a charge. We don't have, we don't have, we're not building up a charge card thing that we got to pay off at some point. It's right, only exists right now, right in this moment. The future has not happened yet. The past is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. We just have this sacred moment. And boy, to allow in this moment a gap for joy. What better gift could we give to ourselves? What better gift could we give to every organ of our body that we're going through? Uh, Archbishop Alfred D'Souza, he's, he's the Archbishop Bishop in North India. And he was talking about obstacles to joy. And this was such an eye-opener for me. He said, for a long time, it seemed to me that life was about to begin, real life. Have you ever felt that? And I, then it will begin, then it will begin. But there was always some obstacle in the way, something to be gotten through first, some unfinished business, time still to be served, a debt to be paid. Then life would begin. At last it dawned on me that these obstacles were my life. Wow. It dawned on me that these obstacles were my life. We say when this happens then, or after this I will, we are missing the life that is right here now may not be what we intellectually would have chosen, but there's something in our soul that brought it into our experience. Our soul knows, even if our intellect doesn't know yet. So how will we live knowing we will die? Decide, are you living a commonplace life? Or are you in a creative space life? Common space, creative space. Feel the difference. Creative space where anything can happen, where you can walk in the joy all the time. And learn to see our world with beginner eyes, in, uh, beginner's mind and infant eyes. You know, um, who was, t I can't, oh, somebody was talking to me about their baby recently and they said, yeah, everything is just so new to them. You know, they find their toe, oh, look at this, this is just amazing, you know? Or they, they find their ears, and, oh, what is this? It's just, that's a, those infant eyes where you see everything really for the first time, look at it very differently. And that your mind doesn't say, I have all the answers, but it says, is, I have all the questions. We biologically still have a caveman brain in a very modern world. I, I love this Time magazine. It says, why we worry about the wrong things. Because <laughs> we do, you know, we do. So really giving ourselves permission to be creative and, you know, to put that worry aside. So um, I'm going to go on to our meditation right now because it just feels like meditation time. Uh, so I'm going to invite you uh, to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you and let's check in on our body. Hmm, is it comfortable? Is it unencumbered? There's that breath. Oh, what a delight, what a joy. And look at that, another one right after it. Joyful breath after joyful breath. In this moment is eternity. In this moment is infinity. And we are the glorious expression 
that is part of it. Without us, the whole cosmos would be left, left wanting, left needing. That joy that only we can bring. That color that is us on the canvas of eternity. That brush stroke that is our action as this new piece of art develops and evolves. No matter what is happening in our life right now, we each have the permission, we each have the right to feel that inner joy, that comfort that comes from knowing that not only are we loved, but we can also love. That we are connected in infinite ways. That we are one of the lamps of the God light. And so we just remind ourselves in the words of Simon and Garfunkel to slow down. We move too fast. We want to make this moment last, holding it tightly with an open hand, knowing that nothing stops or stands stills, except for this very instant, and then it's gone. We, kicking down those cobblestones, those struggles of life, those times that we trip and still get back up, because we're looking for that joy of life, the feeling fun and groovy. The morning, the sun, the beginning is always dropping those beautiful light drops upon us. Petals of the sun, which we grow in our heart to embrace, to accept, to smell the fragrance to total, totally embody the new beginning of each sacred moment. Life, we do love you, and all is groovy, and so it is. Amen.
Yeah. <laughs> you feel it. Feel it. Okay, spiritual practice for the week. You're going to have one less marble after this week if you're, if you're doing the marble game. I did it just for the year, not for the next 20. Um, remembering that joy is in the journey, not the destination. You don't try to be joyful, you just experience it. And we dance as if no one's watching us, right? Our own self. We love as if we've never been hurt before, even though we know love embalms that hurt, if it will. And sing as if no one can hear you, unless you're Gregan on the mic. Live as though heaven is on earth, and life, I love you, all is groovy. Let's say that together. Life, I love you, all is groovy. Okay, come on up, Luann. Take us on home. <laughs> Sacred exchange time. <laughs>